study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 16. Hello, saints, peace, grace, and love in Christ Jesus be with all of you. In my last, one of my last videos titled Daniel, Daniel's Prophecy, Rapture Mystery, Right Division, I told you that in a future video, I'd be sharing with you something that I found while comparing the King James Version Bible to a uh, newer version. Now, before we begin this study, let me say from the bottom of my heart here and now that I'm doing this with love for you saints and i'm serious when i say that if you're a brother or sister of mine in christ jesus i regard you as family and i would do anything anything in the world to keep you from being hurt especially deceived so in this video i'm going to be pointing out things that may uh might hit close to home for you you might be using this version of the bible i've used several versions of the bible throughout my lifetime studying god's word and uh, so you might be using this version too, all right? But, you know, it, it took me a, a dear brother in Christ Jesus to confront me and love me enough to show me why I should be using the King James Version Bible only. And he told me to stop messing around with other versions that are designed, okay? The, they are designed to hurt you spiritually especially to hurt your growth spiritually okay so this precious brother of mine warned me about this and uh, he, he confronted me and he showed me just how these other versions would stunt my growth in Christ Jesus again I'm doing this to help you not to hurt you I'm doing this to expose the enemy and how he's stunting your growth in the body of Christ. So please keep that in mind throughout this video. I love you dearly, brothers and sisters, and I can't wait to meet all of you one day soon. Now, if you recall, some time ago, I made a video called Busted, Caught, Red-Handed, and that was all about the NIV. We compared it to the King James Version Bible, and we studied the plans of the principalities, powers, and people to change the wording of scripture in such a way that it would forever change the meaning of God's word. And in changing the word of God, they're changing the meaning of who we are in Christ Jesus. And, and worse, they're changing the gospel of salvation, how we get saved, our security in salvation, okay? Now, at the beginning of this video, I read to you 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 and 16 and in verse 16 it's very seldom included when reading uh, 2 Timothy 2 and um, very seldom quoted to the audience and it's unfortunate because in verse 16 Paul mentions something very important he tells Timothy exactly what to avoid what to avoid doing so let's look at verse 16 real quick 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 16 but shun profane and vain babblings. What will they do if you do not shun these things? They will increase unto more ungodliness. Notice the phrase that Paul uses here, profane and vain babblings. So what exactly are profane and vain babblings? It's, an inter it's interesting that Paul tells us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God and so on. Then in the next verse, in 16, he in the very next verse, in the ne very next sentence, he includes something, our very first lesson of what studying is all about. Paul uses a phrase very seldom used by anyone today. Uh, when they read the scripture, it's as if Paul is testing us right off the bat by including a phrase to see if we take the time to study it out, showing ourselves approved unto God. Now, to find out exactly what it means, right? Interesting. 
I can't wait to meet Paul one day. Uh, you know, what a wonderful person he is. I cannot wait to meet Paul. I have a lot of questions for him. And um, I appreciate everything that the Lord has done through our precious brother Paul. Amen. Okay, so let's look up the phrase profane and vain babblings and see exactly what Paul means by this. Now, the word profane here translates over to the Greek word uh, babelos, right? Babelos, from the base of balos, a threshold, which means accessible, lawful, to be trodden, unhallowed, common. Interesting word, common, public place, another interesting phrase, of men, ungodly, heathenistic, used by common man, used for everyday use and made simplistic for understanding, degraded or even watered down from its original content. Now I added the last of this definition here uh, to explain a little bit better what common means, what public place would mean, the public place of men the common everyday use uh, and so forth so it's very interesting I'm starting to see a picture here just by that definition what we call today uh, the newer easier to understand versions of the Bible the common ones being used right uh, the the ones that are in common place or in the uh, the version of the Bibles that are most of the public is being used right more simplistic for understanding but it's also being degraded and watered down from its original meanings so again a more simplistic form of scripture is being used uh, today in mankind and uh, maybe it's just me but let's move on to the next word vain babblings what does this mean well in the Greek we see this word kenophena ah right kenophena I can't pronounce that. And anyway, it means empty discussion, discussion of vain and useless matters, empty sounding, fruitless discussion. Again, for some reason, I see a picture of newer versions of the Bible, words reduced to the lesser forms, changing the meaning, empty sounding, fruitless, right? And so on. Paul uses this phrase again. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 20, uh, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust of avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Oppositions of science here is interesting. And uh, it to me sounds a whole lot like the theory of evolution that we hear today. Trying to explain away the existence of creation by our Lord Jesus Christ by using science to to uh, you know do away with how creation actually came to be right they tried to use science to explain away the truth of what God did again it could just be me but it sure sounds like uh, I could be right on the money so if we're to study the phrase profane and vain babblings we can see obviously it's nothing good and from the definition in the Greek, we see that it, it's reducing text or simplifying words that can also change its meaning, right? Making the text and phrases uh, reduced to the point where its meaning is completely lost and even changed to the point that it negates the original meaning. In other words, we see this happening with the new perversions or, conver or conversions of God's word with the lesser forms of text including and but not limited to the NIV and the New King James Version and the ASB the American Standard uh, Standard Bible and the list goes on and on there's probably you know 40 50 different versions of the Bible and none of them are the King James Version Bible they all sway far from the truth of the original and when we continue with what Paul says to Timothy, we see the very result of profane and vain babblings, corrupting the truth of God's word uh, with man's interpretations and perversions always equals false teaching, false doctrines, confusion and contention. Uh, look at the next verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 17. And their word 
will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. It's interesting how Paul compares false teaching to a cancer eating away at the body. Here Paul says that these profane and vain babblings eat away at our understanding of truth, just like a canker, or in comparison, a cancer eating away at the flesh. You see, Hymenaeus and Philetus, they were confusing the truth of God's word by trying to change the meaning with their own perversions, their own ideas, their own interpretations. False teaching can only be the result of such wickedness, right? Also notice that Philetus and Hymenaeus were teaching what they were teaching. The, they, they were the first ones to teach the post-trib false teaching, right? They were teaching that their resurrection had already taken place and that the body of Christ uh, would have to wait until the end of Daniel's week to be caught up. And we continue to see that false teaching of the post-tribulation rapture even today. It's nothing new, folks. As soon as Jesus revealed the mystery of the rapture to the Apostle Paul and Paul revealed it to the body of Christ, Satan attacks the rapture mystery immediately. And we see an example of that with Philetus and Hymenaeus. And I think we can agree that whatever Paul meant by profane and vain babblings, he didn't mean it as a good thing, right? But instead, he warns Timothy not to do it, even telling Timothy to avoid it altogether, okay? Now, moving on, please look with me at Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive not only in the NIV uh, do we find dangerous dangerous changes and, per and dangerous perversions counterfeits of God's word but so do we find the same things in the New King James Version Bible now I really think uh, I didn't think I'd find as many problems in the New King James Version as I did with the NIV but wow 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 did I find some outrageous in your face flat-out deceptions within the New King James Version Bible and I'm talking about changes that directly impact a person's salvation and the relationship with our Lord God and for that reason I felt it necessary to expose this blatant attempt to dismantle God's Word look at 2nd Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine did Paul tell Timothy to just avoid false teaching? Did Paul say, Timothy, just ignore these false teachings and pretend they never happened? Absolutely not. Paul tells Timothy to do the opposite from ignoring it. Paul tells Timothy to expose it, exhort it, and reprove these false teachings. And obviously, Paul wants us to expose these things for a reason. And it's to make us aware of the devil's devices, warning the saints of how the enemy works to deceive and cause confusion within the body of Christ. And one way he does that is by twisting God's word. We see the enemy do this first with Eve in the garden, how he questions God's word, even changing what God originally said to Eve resulting in deceiving her to commit treason against the Most High God. Okay, now on with the exposition of the New King James Version Bible. We're, we're going to do this study very much the same way that we did with the NIV in the previous video. We'll compare scripture with scripture from both texts and we'll look at a dozen or two examples. Uh, we can't look at everything in this video because that could take hours and hours. But what I'll do is I'm going to leave a link in the description box. And if you want to see more on this, if you want to expand on your understanding in this area, uh, I'm going to leave all the information for you to be able to do that.
all right now my hope is that after you've seen the truth of this matter you'll appreciate the king james version bible even more and you'll also make that bible your only source for god's word your only source for study and so forth so now sometimes i get comments from people that really make me concerned and i wonder how some people can be so confused so lost so so blinded from knowing what god's word actually says and i've come to the conclusion that there's really three reasons why people are very confused today regarding what god's word says what it, his word means and the context of his word and first the first reason i the reason i see for them being confused is because they're not rightly dividing god's word number two it's because they have no knowledge of dispensations how the bible is written and the third it's because they're using everything but the king james version bible they're they, they've never seen the true words of god you see if you're born into this world and the only thing you're ever made aware of let's use counterfeit money for an example when you're born into the world if you're only exposed to counterfeit money counterfeit five dollar bills tens twenties fifties hundreds and your whole life you've been using counterfeit money that's all you've ever seen until the age of 40 right and that's the only thing you've ever known is this counterfeit money but when you turn 40 years old someone approaches you and they show you the real money they show you a real five dollar bill a real 10 20 50 100 and now you see the real money and you can easily see how that counterfeit isn't real because you have the original you have the real version to compare it uh, to the counterfeit you know you have to you can compare these things together and you can see which one is false and which one is true but if you're not exposed to the true form you'll never know the difference and that's what's happening with the versions of the Bible you see if you start out in life using all the newer versions and you stay away from the King James Version and you keep using these new versions you know the, the American Standard the New King James the NIV and so forth and you're only exposed to the counterfeit versions you'll never notice the difference unless a loving saint shows you the real version the real money the real Bible you see then you have something to compare it to then you can see where all the mistakes are you can see how the enemy has been changing the original to make a counterfeit you see the enemy is hard at work to confuse confound uh, discourage and blind as many people as possible keeping them from learning the truth the truth of who God is who Jesus Christ is and who we are in the body of Christ Jesus now we're gonna be going over some pictures and some symbols and some Bible verses lots of information very important information and towards the end of this video there's a very important uh, recording that I'd like to share with y'all that you really need to hear to understand why this counterfeit Bible or these versions are being pushed on the population okay now you don't want to miss that interview that recording and it's towards the end okay so let's begin with the next part here shall we uh, the first thing I want to point out is this symbol that seems to be used on many of the New King James Version Bibles it caught my eye I did some research on this symbol and what I found was quite shocking to say the least now image number one picture one I'm not sure if it's on every New King James Version Bible but from what I've seen it's on most of them so what's this symbol all about here on this image in front of you in in one of the covers of the New King James Version Bible notice this symbol is very unique in its form 
and presentation. While doing the research on this, lo and behold, this symbol is used by many other people as well. Far and, re far and removed from Christianity, I might add. Now, one of them happens to be a very famous, famous uh, band or a group of musicians, the band called Led Zeppelin. Now, I have to admit, when I, in my younger, my, my younger years, uh, Led Zeppelin was one of the best bands that I used to listen to amongst all the other ones, which I can admit to you now that those bands are extremely satanic and you do not want the sounds of their music going through your ears and into your mind. Believe me when I say that. So picture uh, number two here is again Led Zeppelin. It's common knowledge that the members of the group of Led, Ze Led, Led, Led Zeppelin practiced the occult and followed the teachings of Aleister Crowley, a Satanist, a self-professed antichrist who wrote many books on Satanism, worshiping demons, conjuring up demons to do his bidding, and so forth. Now, on this next picture, picture three, here's a picture of Aleister Crowley. Notice his hat having the pyramid, the all-seeing eye, the eye uh, uh, of Horus, Horus being the false god of the sun, or the sun god. And next to him is one of the books he's written, the cover having the pentagram predominantly on the cover there's no doubt even by looking at this person that he's involved in satanism and you're going to see why this is important later on uh this picture here especially the uh satanic bible okay we're going to look at who is the publisher for the satanic bible today you're going to be surprised in picture number four here, in this picture, notice the second one under John Paul Jones is the same symbol used here as the one on the cover of the New King James Version Bible. Very interesting. Also note that the members of Led Zeppelin were very open about their following of Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey and the occult even many of their songs were written about the occult stairway to heaven being one of them and it's been said that many of their lyrics came directly by channeling spirits these spirits obviously being demons told them what to write in their songs and also we see an example here of selling your soul for wealth and fame you know this band sold out to the power of demons for money it made them very very rich rich while well, alive on earth but in the next life it makes them very poor and in torment and in a place called hell forever and ever i ask you is it worth it is it worth it to live rich for 50 60 and a lot of these musicians die very young a lot of them die in their late 20s early 30s is it worth it 30 years compared to eternity is nothing is nothing they've been tricked into selling their souls God's Word tells us in Matthew 16 in verse 26 for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul here we see men who gained the whole world but ultimately ended up losing their souls to the devil this next picture, picture five, here's another one. Again, connecting Jimmy Page to Aleister Crowley, Led Zeppelin to Aleister Crowley, under the top heading where it says Led Zeppelin. Directly under that, we see Jimmy Page, a disciple of Aleister Crowley. And under that, we see various words of the occult, Sozo, Oto, Oto, the letters Oto. It stands for Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, the Order of the Oriental Templars, or the Order of the Temple of the East. Oto is dedicated to the high purpose of securing the liberty of the individual and his or her advancement in light, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and power through beauty, courage, and wit. 
on the foundation of universal brotherhood. What a load of baloney that is. Ordo Templi Orientis is the, supposedly to this article, what this says, is the first of the orders to accept the Book of the Law, received by Aleister Crowley in 1904. This book proclaims a new age in human thought, culture, and religion. The age arises from the Law of Th Thelema, which is where the popular phrase in Luciferianism comes from, the phrase, do what thou wilt. Okay, And, of course, we see the number 666 over Crowley's head, and we all know what the number 666 means. We read about it in the book of Revelation, and it's connected to the identity of the beast, the Antichrist system, and so forth. Not only do we see Led Zeppelin using this symbol, but it's commonly used uh, also in witchcraft, right? Take a look at this one here in picture six. Here we see a book cover, the craft, which is book of shadows. Again, this symbol, same symbol, is being used by the occult. Now, take a look right under the title. For some reason, they printed the, the symbol very small and hardly noticeable. So here we see a book of witchcraft using this same symbol. And over to the right, we see the inner page of the New King James Version Bible and notice the symbol they use. It's the exact same symbol being used both in one of Satan's books and a counterfeit version of God's book. Notice at the bottom, we see the publisher's name here, Thomas Nelson. It's a very familiar name. And if you do some research on Thomas Nelson Publishing Group, you'll discover that not only do they publish counterfeit Bibles, but they also publish many other books. And some of them are on the occult. And one of them happens to be the official Satanic Bible. In fact, Harper Collins Publishers is the parent company of both Thomas Nelson Publishing and Zondervan Publishing. They're the world's largest Christian publishers of books, audio recordings, video recordings, and Bibles. Interestingly enough, they also publish, again, the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. So, the parent company who prints the New King James Version Bible also prints the Satanic Bible as well. There's something wrong with that picture here. In this next image, picture 7, here's a close-up of the same book. You see the symbol here a bit better. The exact symbol that's on the New King James Version Bible. Uh, picture 8, again, this is a cover of another book, obviously promoting the New Age religion. It wouldn't surprise me if the symbol of the Antichrist is something similar to this symbol that we're looking at here. It could be. Uh, picture 9, again, another cover. This time, it's the New King James Version Bible. The same symbol as those on the witchcraft books, Led Zeppelin, the New Age book covers, and so forth. In this next image, image 10, here's the first page in the New King James Version Bible. Here again, we see this occultic symbol blatantly displayed. Image 11, another Bible picture with the same symbol on this cover. Image 12, same symbol being used here. Image 13, and here's a collage of pagan symbols commonly being used today. Again, we see the same symbol being used on the New King James Version Bible. All right, so now let's look at a few more things about the New King James Version Bible. Just a few more facts, and then we're going to get into what I really wanted to share with you in, in a little bit, okay? Now, over 100,000 translations have been made to the New King James Version Bible. 100,000 trans it changes, okay? That's a lot. That's, and on average, that's eight changes per page, okay? Now, notice that these words here on this list are removed from the New King James Version Bible. The word hell is removed 22 times. The word blood, 23 times. The word repent 44 times. It's just interesting they use, they, they remove it 44 times because the number four, 44 
444 is a representation of tribulation, trials, and testing, right? Heaven is removed 50 times. God is removed 51 times. Lord is removed 66 times. Interesting that it's number 66, right? Also, we see uh, they remove the phrases devils, damnation, Jehovah, New Testament. They're all completely removed uh, out of this New King James Version Bible. Now, let's take a look at how the New King James Version Bible changes the context okay, from the King James Version Bible. And we're going to do that by comparing verse to verse. All right. First verse we're going to look at is in John. John 1. A very firm, a famous verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, compare that to the New King James Version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, good so far. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made notice how they remove the fact that all things were made by Jesus Christ instead they say things were made through Jesus Christ but not by him attacking the character of who Jesus Christ is as being the son of God God in the flesh uh, you know and so forth they remove that character okay they attack his character Next verse in Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. In the New King James, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The King James Version tells us that sanctification is a one-time event. It happens when you are saved. And the New King James Version Bible makes it look like sanctification happens throughout time or through time, lending to a works-based sanctification, ultimate lending to a works-based salvation. Again, works-based teaching is going on here in this new version. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In a new version, for the message of the cross is full in foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Saved and being saved. Again, they make it look like salvation is a process of good works, a total lie, and and really, the New King James Version Bible is exactly what the major religions are teaching today. Salvation is a process. It happens over time through good works, right? That's what the major religions are teaching today. And it's very dangerous and it can confuse you if you're not careful, especially if you've never seen the genuine words of God. If the only thing you're used to is this counterfeit version, I don't blame you for believing that salvation is a process, that salvation can be lost, that salvation is something you earn. I don't blame you for believing that because you are reading exactly what your Bible says if you're using a corrupted version, you see. But if you use the original and the real sanctified words of God that cannot be published, that cannot be uh, be prostituted out for money then you get to see that salvation is a one-time deal it happens excuse me it happens once it cannot be lost it is not a process over time it is a gift given to you now when somebody gives you a gift do they hand over to you the gift or do they give you part of the gift and then give you pieces of the same gift throughout the year right of course not that sounds silly when you get a gift from somebody you get the whole thing salvation is a gift it's a free gift we don't deserve it we don't earn it we cannot earn 
the gift of salvation. It's impossible. To say that we can earn the gift of salvation is to say that what we do is more powerful than what our Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's ludicrous. That is satanic. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. New King James, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. Big, big problem. And among those who are perishing. Again, saved and being saved. Works-based salvation. Hiding the fact that salvation is a one-time event and making it look like salvation is a process over time. Exa again, exactly what's being taught <clears throat> in the major religions today. It's a works-based religion. It's a works-based good deeds system. And the reason why they like to teach that system is because they can put a control over you. You see, they can control you if, if you believe that your salvation comes by doing good things or doing things in general. Then guess where that list of good things is going to come from? It's going to come from that religion you're involved with. They're going to dictate to you what you need to do. And don't be surprised if some things on that list involve you giving them all your money involve you being at their congregational uh, meetings four or five times a week, involves you saying prayers over and over and over again. Inv I mean, the list is long, friends. The enemy is working overtime to try to deceive the world. He's doing a very good job. And by removing God's word and replacing it with his word, 90% of the battle is done, right? But we know God's word will never come to an end. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against the word of God. Notice how the New King James Version gives us no command to study God's word. The famous grace teaching verse that we use all the time, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, right? A workman not needed to be ashamed. Now look at 2 Timothy in the New King James Version. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. How in the world does that even remotely mean anything to what the King James Version says? King James Version, study to show thyself approved unto God. Okay, we know clearly study, I mean, study what? Well, obviously it's the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? In the New King James Version, it says, be diligent to present yourself. How do we do that? Be diligent in what? How do I present myself diligent? You see, big problem. Again, trying to shove a works-based salvation down your throat. You know, the more I think about it, the more I study on these new versions, the more I'm convinced that these new versions are directly the result of the Catholic religion. Because the more you study these new versions, the more you can see the relationship between what it's saying and what the Catholic Church teaches. In 1 Corinthians 1, 22, For the Jews require a sign, <clears throat> and the Greeks seek after wisdom. In the New Version, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. They request a sign. Here we see the attempt to remove the identity of Israel versus the body of Christ. It's replacement theology 101 being taught here. In Acts 3.26, Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. 
in the new version to you first God having raised up his servant Jesus okay sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities here we see a blatant attempt to hide the identity of Jesus Christ as being the son of God by calling him the servant of God there's a huge difference between the son and the servant in the Bible chapter 4 of Galatians Paul expresses the seriousness of becoming a son versus being a servant look at Galatians 4 real quick uh, chapter 4 verse 4 through 6 but when the fullness of the time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and because ye are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba father wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son and if a son then an heir of God through Christ notice in the King James the new King James and because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out Abba father therefore you are no longer a slave Wow no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir of God through Christ so the new version is calling Jesus in Acts chapter 3 26 the slave of God or God having raised up his slave Jesus sent him to bless you again pure blasphemy and the removal of who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God God in the flesh 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 in the King James therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things become new matches what our Lord Jesus says in Mark 16 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature okay now look at the new version 2 Corinthians 5 17 therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new so the writers of the New King James Version or perversion think Jesus's words calling us the new creatures isn't good enough and needs to be changed to making us a new creation you see that they remove the individualism they remove our identity as saints in the body of Christ they're removing this identity I guess they know better than the Lord Jesus does right I mean I don't think so okay so those things being serious enough you know there's even worse than that in other places and these other places completely change who you are in Christ Jesus and how you're saved today look at the King James Version Romans 322 even the righteousness of God now pay close attention to these verses okay this these verses are the reasons uh, why I made this video in the last couple videos ago I told you that I found something that is significant and would change how you know how you you perceive salvation and what you believe salvation is and so forth these are those reasons this is the reason for this video and you need to pay attention because if you don't pay attention you're gonna miss out you're gonna miss it completely it's very subtle okay again Romans 322 even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference in the new version even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference notice the faith of Jesus is the righteousness of God but the new version says that our faith in Christ Jesus makes God righteous did you catch that 
That's pure blasphemy. They make it look like it's because we believe in God. Then that makes him righteous. You see, they're saying that because they're saying through our works, our good deeds, we become righteous. And through us becoming righteous, we make God righteous. You see that? That is blasphemy, friends. You see how they twist it? Let's look at another one. Romans 3.3 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? A new version. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Again, twisting the holy character of our righteous Lord God. Next one, Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. New King James Version Notice the differences here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Two things with this verse here. Notice this. First, they remove the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law to, to completion by his faithfulness not our faithfulness his faithfulness he completed the law he he nailed the law to the cross because he was faithful not because we were it's not by our faith but it's his faith that's important here in these verses Second, notice how the New King James makes no sense grammatically. It's not, it's, it's not grammatically correct. They point to our faith in Christ two times. Okay, Look back uh, at Galatians 2.16. They say, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. You see how they say in Jesus Christ and in Christ Jesus? It says it's the same thing. They're using that same thing twice. The only thing they changed is the order of Jesus Christ and Christ Jesus. You see, they changed that. And they removed of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ, and they put in, in, right? which changes the context. It changes everything. Again, it's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faithfulness to fulfill the law completely to remove us from the power of the law. In Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me the new version i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live how by the faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself i i live by the faith of the son of god you see that we live by the faith of the son of god not in the son of god it's jesus who was faithful to die on the cross. He was faithful enough to believe that he would die on the cross, that he would be buried, and he would rise again back to life on the third day. It's by his faithfulness. Our Lord Jesus believed and had faith that one day he would be crucified, be buried, and rise again from the grave. He had faith that in doing these things, he would pay for all of our sins. And in order to claim that promise, we have to have the same faith in the same things that our Lord Jesus had to do before, right? All these things that happened to him. We have to have faith in those things as the body of Christ 
But Jesus had the faith in those things as well, you see. And they try to twist that. They try to change these things. Can you see how the New King James Version removes the faith of our Lord Jesus? They completely remove his faith. They completely remove the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Completely gone, vanished. Okay? They remove his identity and they make it ours. That is satanic to the core, my friends. Galatians 3.22 But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You see that? The new version, But the scripture hath confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Again, our Lord's faith, His faith, is the subject in these verses here. It's by His faith that what He would do for us would be the final payment for all sin. Not our faith, but His faith again, you see. And again, we see the part we, that we play. Salvation was made complete first by our Lord Jesus' faith and then by our belief in what He did for us. You see that? We'll discuss why it's so important to have both and not just our faith in a bit. King James Version, Ephesians 3.12 In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Faith of Him. His faith. New Version. In whom we have boldness and access <clears throat> with confidence through faith in Him. You see that? See how they twisted that again. They change it from his faithfulness, his faith, making it our faith. Okay? Philippians 3 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Whose faith is it? Christ's faith. It's his faith, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The new version, of course, we know what's going to happen here. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. You see that? They remove his faith and they replace it with our faith. Listen, friends, if our salvation is dependent on our faith and faithfulness, then we have a problem. We have a serious problem because our faith wavers from day to day. You, you can even lose your faith and still be saved. You know, something bad could happen in your life and you're down and you're, you're depressed because you lost a loved, a loved one maybe. And it really hits you really, really hard where it hurt. And you're upset with God. You're angry with God. You can't understand why these things happen. And you lose some faith, right? So if you lose some faith because of your emotions, then that would mean you could lose salvation, right? But the truth of the matter is, we read in the King James Version Bible, is that our salvation, the foundation of our salvation, is by His faith. His faithfulness, you see? No matter what we do, Jesus Christ will always be faithful. He will always be in faith. He cannot lose faith. It's his faith that secures us in salvation. And it's because of his faith and his faithfulness that we're sealed and secure in our salvation. And it, we cannot lose our salvation. You see that? Once again, they try to remove the faith of Jesus Christ and they put all the responsibility on us. The New King James says, it's all your faith that counts to be saved. So how secure would your salvation be if it was all about your faith and not Jesus' faith as well? It takes both of us. Again, making it look like it's a works-based salvation and also making it look like you can lose your salvation. Once again, lies upon lies upon lies. 
Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. The new version, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Again, we see that the, the, they remove any faith of our Lord God and place it solely on us, mankind. These are serious serious changes that change the context entirely to the point of blasphemy. Now why is it so important that salvation is also from the faith of Jesus Christ and not just faith in Jesus Christ? Let's go over that again. The reason why we can't ever lose our salvation is because of His faith and not just our own okay think about it is your faith perfect from day to day every single day all the time through thick and thin if you're honest you'll say no and you're gonna realize and you do realize that there's times when you may lose your faith because something bad happens in your life right according to the New King James Version Bible when you lose your faith in Christ Jesus then you also lose salvation. You become unsaved and you have to start all over again. It's not our faith that keeps us saved. It's the faith of Jesus Christ that keeps us saved 100% of the time. Sealed forever and ever and ever. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment, a seal, a temporary guarantee guarantee that we're secure in our salvation in Christ Jesus because of his faithfulness right his faith never wavers his faith is perfect from day to day it's his faith that seals us for eternity it's his faith that keeps us in the body of Christ it's by his faith plus our belief in him and what he did for us that saves us you see that we may we might waver in our faith from day to day but his faith is what keeps us saved not our own we're saved by his faith because his faith was perfect till the end he believed that the day would come when he would pay for our sins completely through the death burial and resurrection he was 100% faithful and never wavered once. So if we believe on him and what he did for us, we know his faith plus our faith and belief is what secures us for eternity. It keeps us saved forever and we can never, ever, ever lose salvation. To say that we can lose our salvation is to call Jesus an unfaithful God, to call Jesus a liar, and to make him of no effect in our lives. And that's exactly what the new versions of the Bible do. They drag Jesus down to being to our level, an unfaithful man God. They degrade the character of who he really was and is today. So, number one, the New King James Version promotes a works-based salvation, having to endure to the end, making it look like salvation is a process and not a one-time event. Two, they take all the faith away from God the Father and God the Son. They, they take their faith away and they make it look like salvation is all on us, what we do. Again, works-based salvation. Third, they use a symbol directly tied, which I showed you, it's directly tied to Satanism. Let's talk a little bit about the faith of Christ Jesus and why it's so important to understand that there, it, his faith and our faith, and it takes both of us, okay? Seven times in Paul's letters, he refers to the faith of Christ. And each time, his purpose is to emphasize the Lord's worthiness of our complete confidence. You see that? If you look at Galatians 3.22 again, 
and look at the few things here, okay? Just so you, you're clear on, on, on why there's a major difference between the King James and the New King James and why it's so important. Again, Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Christ, Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Here again, we believe because Jesus is worthy of our confidence. In Philippians 3.9, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness you see that not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ it's his faith his righteousness which is of God by faith you see that our Apostle Paul expresses his desire for a righteousness not of our own but that which is through the faith of Christ and then he adds the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here's a, a man's faith again. He has faith in Christ because Christ is completely faithful. Our Lord is faithful. He's completely worthy. And that's why we believe in him. And we trust him, you see. He paid the full penalty for our sins and is now in heaven dispensing to each of us through the Holy Spirit the riches of his grace his mercy his forgiveness but remember the faith of Christ always precedes our faith in Christ you see that what good would it do us to believe in him for salvation if he wasn't reliable or if he wasn't or if he was unfaithful what good would it do for us to believe in him if he was unfaithful nothing you see we'd have to depend on our works again right and that's what they want us to believe we know without a doubt that jesus can be trusted he can be trusted 100 percent of the time to save to the uttermost okay who come unto god by him in hebrews 7 25. this is the exact reason why paul was able to say to the jailer, the terrified jailer at Philippi, Philippi, Paul said uh, to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see that? Acts 16, 31. Paul knew full well that Jesus was without a doubt the most trustworthy person, man, God in the universe. So why all the changes with the Bibles? I mean, sometimes the changes don't even make any sense any grammatical sense so why are they doing it we're gonna find out I'd like to share something with you real quick it's a recording of a man who was privy to some information passed down to him by a doctor okay who was privy to some of the uh, let's call them elites or the Illuminati if you will okay the the people way on top who are directly under Satan himself their plans right those guys those are the ones I'm talking about the and this guy is speaking uh, the one speaking here is a pediatrician and he's he's speaking to a group of pediatricians in confidence he tells them he doesn't want them to take notes or use any recorders or anything like that so uh, you know this guy that's telling this is doing it from memory all right he's a doctor he has a good memory in fact he says he has a uh, photographic memory and Everything you, you'll see everything he says makes a lot of sense. So they're they're attending a conference just for doctors pediatricians and the speaker confides in them and tells them the plans of the uh, the, the elite for humanity and part of this plan involves the Bible and religion Which is why I want you to listen to this clip. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but just a clip. Okay now what I've done is save the part where he's talking about this again uh, their plans to change the Bible in order to accomplish their agenda and we're gonna go ahead and play that in this video and then maybe you'll understand why the new versions are so different than the actual version right the the, the King James version Bible and it all has to do there's there's a purpose for this folks understand there's a reason why these new versions are out there Every time I see a phrase, new version, I think there's really nothing new about this at all. Actually, the enemy's been doing this since day one, all the way back in the garden, twisting God's word, right? When Satan challenged Eve 
And, and he said, did God really say that? Maybe he meant something else. Surely he didn't mean you die from eating a, you know, from the tree of good and evil. Surely there's miscommunication here somewhere, Eve, right? But the very same method of deception is being used today to, de to deceive everyone. Anyway, I'll include the link for this video in the description box if you want to listen to the whole video. And I suggest you do because it's very revealing to what's going on right now in the world and it's all pointing to Daniel's 70th week and it's all pointing to the Antichrist and the one world religion okay so let me share with you a small section of this recording uh, again specifically the section that talks about the Bible and so forth and we're gonna try to do this on this video here let's see if we can make it work okay alright so there you should see the video now and I'm going to go ahead and mic, uh, mute my voice here so we can play this real quick, okay? Now, excuse me for a moment. Another area of discussion was religion. Uh, this is a, an avowed atheist speaking. Uh, and he said, religion is not necessarily bad. A lot of people seem to need religion with its mysteries and rituals, so they will have religion. But the major re religions of today have to be changed because they are not compatible with the changes to come. The old religions will have to go, especially Christianity. Once the Roman Catholic Church is brought down, the rest of Christianity will follow easily. Then a new religion can be accepted for use all over the world. It will incorporate something from all of the old ones to make it more easy for people to accept it and feel at home in it. Most people won't be too concerned with religion. They will realize that they don't need it. In order to do this, the Bible will be changed. It will be rewritten to fit the new religion. Gradually, key words will be replaced with, with new words having various shades of meaning. Then the meaning attached to the new word uh, can be close to the old word. And as time goes on, other shades of meaning of that word can be emphasized. And then gradually, that word replaced with another word. Um, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that uh, everything in Scripture need not be rewritten, just key words replaced by other words and uh, the variability in meaning attached to any word can be uh, used as a uh, tool to change the entire meaning of scripture and therefore make it acceptable to this uh, new religion. Most people won't know the difference, and this is another one of the times where he said, the few who do notice the difference won't be enough to matter. Then followed one of the most surprising statements of the whole presentation. He said, some of you probably think the churches won't stand for this. And he went on to say, the churches will help us. There is no elaboration on this. Uh, it was unclear just uh, what he had in mind when he said the churches will help us. In retrospect, I think uh, some of us now can understand what he might have meant at that time. I recall then only of thinking, no, they won't and remembering our Lord's words uh, where he said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, uh, yes, uh, some people in the churches might help, and in the subsequent 20 years we've seen how uh, some people in churches have helped. But we also know that our Lord's words uh, will stand, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Another area of discussion was education, and uh, one of the things in connection with education that uh, I remember connecting with what he said about religion was, uh, uh, in addition to changing the Bible, he said that uh, classics in literature would be changed. Um, I seem to recall Mark Twain's writings was given as uh, one example, but he said the uh, casual reader reading a revised version of a classic would never even suspect there was any change and uh, somebody would have to go through word by word to even recognize that any change was made 
in these classics, the changes would be so subtle, but the changes would be such as to uh, uh, promote the uh, acceptability of the new system. As regards education, he indicated that uh, kids would spend more time in schools, but in many schools they wouldn't learn anything. Uh, they'll learn some things, but not as much uh, as formerly. Okay, so you can see that the elite and their plans here are intentional. Okay, they're intentionally changing the Bible in order to fulfill their plans for mankind. And we know what that plan is, don't we? We know it's Daniel's 70th week. We know it's the ushering in of the Antichrist and his one world religion. It's all being prepared now. And I'm using this as, as an example with the new versions. The New King James Version, the NIV, the ASB, and so on and so on and so on. Friends, it is not God that's changing His Word and giving you these other books to make it easier for you to understand. It's not Him doing that. It's the enemy doing that. So in essence, if you really think about it, my friends, you are using the enemy's book. His books. You've got the enemy's books. You're studying from the enemy's books. You're studying from the enemy's version of what God said. Did God really say that thou would die? I'm paraphrasing. You see, that's why I'm doing this video. So, in closing, if you want to see the full list of changes in the King James versus the New King James, just type in Google King James Version uh, to New King James Version changes, and you'll see a bunch of different sites that point out how demonic those changes really are. Now, please, again, again, understand that I'm pointing out these things out of love because I genuinely care about you, saints, and I don't want you to be manipulated by those whose job it is to confuse you and ultimately to cause you frustration and depression and worry about if you're saved or not you see that's a big one there are so many brothers and sisters out there it makes me really really sad when they send me a message they email me or private message me and they're crying because they're not convinced that they're saved. They go to bed at night worried if they're really saved or not. Friends, there's no need for that. There's no need to be worried about your salvation if you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He came here, put on a suit of flesh. He nailed your sins to the cross with him he paid for your sins he paid it in full for you and he took your sins into the grave with him and he was buried for three days or in the tomb for three days and on the third day he rose again in full victory you see he didn't bring your sins out of the grave with him he didn't have a bag of your sins when he rose from the grave he left your sins in the grave and he rose in full righteousness and he covers you with that righteousness today. It's sad when you can't sleep at night because you're worried if you're going to miss the rapture. I get it. I used to, I was there too. I was one of those that wasn't 100% convinced that if the rapture happened, I'd be going. And I'll tell you the biggest contribution to those thoughts that I was having was the fact that I was using other versions of the Bible and I was not using the King James Version Bible. I was being manipulated. I was being fed a bunch of lies and so on. You can prevent all those heartaches by just sticking to that the, the pure form of His Word and avoid dabbling in the world's versions, the enemy's versions of God's Word, okay? The counterfeits. If you really want to understand the Bible, 
and be secure about your salvation in Christ Jesus, you need to do three things, my friends. Use the King James Version only. Okay, after you're saved, all right? Use the King James Version only. Number two, learn right division. And three, learn dispensations. Those things will help you tremendously. So with that, thanks for studying with me. Peace, grace, and love of Christ. Did you catch that? Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. And I'll see you on the next study, Lord willing.